Welcome. Uh, my name is Ray Cantor. I am Vice President of Government Affairs with the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. And um, welcome to our panel on infrastructure for the 21st century. Infrastructure is literally the backbone of our economy, especially in a state like New Jersey, which has proximity to major population centers, both New York and Philadelphia. Um, you know, infrastructure provides, you know, a critical network um, for our supply chain and the hub of commerce in the whole Northeast region. We have, but we have major challenges ahead. We have extensive road network. Uh, uh, many of its components are old and in need of repair or replacement. Our airports uh, tend to lag behind the better facilities we find around the world. And our ports need to be able to handle the increasing traffic that comes from um, a deepening Panama Canal or a deepened Panama Canal and um, you know, the use of mega ships. Our energy infrastructure needs to be able to accommodate, you know, uh, a great capacity of uh, anticipated electrical need because of our carbonization, uh, decarbonization uh, policies. And also, um, you know, uh, again, turning our buildings and transportation toward electrification. Our nuclear fleet, which is, you know, aging, has been the mainstay of our electrical production but it needs to be, um, you know, uh, thought of. Either it needs to be replaced, or um, you know, it, it's also under political and economic threat. Our water infrastructure also is aging and has called into question our water quality and our ability to serve our residents. Um, but how we address these infrastructure issues is going to go a long way to determining how our economy survives and thrives. You know, in the next, you know, several decades. Ahead, with us today are several panelists who are well versed in infrastructure issues, both in New Jersey and also regionally. They will speak to um, how they see our infrastructure needs now and over, you know, in, into the future. Um, so uh, I will start with um, Peter Simon. Um, Peter is the chief of staff uh, to the chairman of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Kevin O'Toole. Um, the Port Authority is an independent by state government agency formed by the states of New York and New Jersey in 1921. The agency owns and operates some of the region's most important and iconic infrastructure, including five airports, six bridges and tunnels, two bus terminals, the largest seaport on the East Coast, and the second busiest in the country, the World Trade Center and the Path Commuter uh, Railroad. Uh, if we're talking about infrastructure in this region, uh, we have to start with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Peter, um, how do you see, um, what are the plans of the Port Authority uh, of New York and New Jersey moving forward and how um, are you gonna impact our region's economy? Sure, uh, thanks Ray. And um, thank you to the NJBIA for hosting this event and look forward to a great discussion with my fellow panelists here. Um, and before I get into that, I, I do, uh, want to thank the 8,000 Port Authority employees uh, who work hard every day. You know, I'm very lucky to be part of uh, this amazing agency, but it, it's it's all of those employees, two thirds of which have continued to go to their workplace every day as essential transportation, health and uh, police workers. So um, without them, you know, none of us would be able to get where we need to go. So I want to thank them. Um, and when we talk about infrastructure, you know, from the Port Authority's perspective, the future is now. Um, you know, one of my colleagues really eloquently um, framed this issue in a way that really stuck with me. And, and what he said is, what we're doing right now, all of us at, at our respective agencies and companies are building the 22nd century's legacy infrastructure. So we look back on, on you know, some of our assets. The Port Authority, as you said, is 99 years old. We turn 100 next year. And um, the amount of, of, of work that goes into maintaining and operating 20 year, 30 year, 40, 60, 80 year old infrastructure um, has never been a bigger challenge. So the Port Authority, like many agencies, has shifted its focus um, over the decades. And right now, um, particularly after much of our uh, financial capacity and focus was on rebuilding the Trade Center after 9-11, we have really returned to our core mission of focusing on transportation, um, shipping, and, and other core assets of the agency. We, we have a 37, and you know, I'll, I'll sort of start pre, pre-pandemic, we have a $37 billion 10-year capital plan. That capital plan touches on all of the um, areas that you mentioned uh, at, at the start, Ray. 
which is airports. We have almost $30 billion when you combine the public and private money to redevelop the Port Authority's airports. Um, in, in New Jersey, construction is ongoing on a $3 billion uh, terminal renovation project, a, a brand new uh, Terminal 1 uh, to replace the aging Terminal A. We also, and that, that, that is well underway, and we look forward to opening the first gates um, in a couple, within the next couple years. We, we also have planned and funded a, a air train at Newark to replace the existing one. That's, you know, will approach 30 years by the time uh, the replacement is finished. And, uh, you know, the procurement has just begun on that project. Uh, across the river at, 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 in New York, we have LaGuardia, which is an $8 billion program, a uh, P3 project that is well underway. Um, many of those initial uh, terminal, new terminal openings have, have happened and uh, we are very happy with the results. It looks like a modern world-class facility and that, that's our commitment. Uh, LaGuardia also has the $2 billion air train uh, program that is uh, entering the environmental uh, review stages. And at JFK, there's a very um, exciting, um, also P3 opportunities for an entire rebuild of, of the airport, leveraging private capital, you know, at least in the pre-pandemic world, uh, nine to one. Um, so, you know, a, a billion or, or a billion and a half of Port Authority dollars will actually get us a $13 billion set of new terminals. Um, move, moving to our tunnels, bridges, and terminals, you know, the uh, raising of the Bayonne Bridge, which has, as you suggested, a, a huge impact on the port and its ability to uh, overtake in 2019 the Port of Long Branch to become the second busiest and second largest port in the country, um, was a, a massive multi-billion dollar project, uh, truly an engineering marvel that allowed us to raise the roadway of the bridge without um, uh, without having to rebuild the entire structure, the arch that uh, was there, it is maintained, and it's uh, been recognized by a number of uh, architectural and engineering firms as, as, as something truly unique and groundbreaking. Um, also underway, $1.9 billion replacement or re restoration, I should say, of the George Washington Bridge. Uh, obviously a very iconic and important asset of the Port Authorities and everything from the decking to the concrete to the replacement of every single suspender rope is, is well underway um, on that project. Uh, very much looking forward to talking about the Port Authority bus terminal replacement project. Anyone who's been through the, the Port Authority bus terminal knows that it is um, long overdue for a replacement and it's, it's approaching 50 years old. And um, we have a, a very exciting nine to $10 billion replacement project. There'll be some news coming out in the coming weeks on that. Uh, very excited to move into the environmental review stage with a single preferred alternative. And um, it's going to be a massively complex and difficult construction. It's essentially three city blocks on the west side of Manhattan, right adjacent to Times Square. But um, we've got some excellent professionals at the agency who I'm sure are, are, are up to the challenge. Um, a little bit further down the road in the you know five to 12 year time frame, we have plans to replace the Lincoln Tunnel Helix and the approach there in Weehawken uh, as you get on uh, the Lincoln Tunnel. At the um, on PATH, our commuter railroad, we are making great strides in improving the reliability of the system due in large part to a you know, billion and a half uh, investment, what we're calling the path improvement plan. It uh, includes a new signal system, as well as you know very targeted maintenance uh, programs that are data driven that allow us to sort of try and, and find the hotspots and attack it with as much resources as possible. Um, and in addition to improving reliability, the new, the new signal system plus running longer trains, which are currently being purchased, will allow us to run nine cars and increase capacity uh, on the most congested lines, the North to World Trade Center and um, the Uptown Line as well. So very excited about those projects. We still uh, are recovering like many uh, agencies from Superstorm Sandy and have on our current 10-year uh, plan $3 billion for Sandy uh, recovery and uh, resiliency projects. Um, down at the port, we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in our ship to rail uh, infrastructure, which has contributed greatly to the uh, uh, gains that we've made in terms of our, our growth of our port, as well as a billion dollars for war wharf and berth replacement. Um, that is nowhere nearly enough for what uh, we're going to need in the sort of 20 to 30 year time horizon for the berths and wharfs. But, um, you know, certainly can't 
under or overestimate the importance of the port and the commerce and that moves through those facilities uh, on the economy overall and on the regional employment and the ability for all of us to uh, get the goods and, and, and food and, and all essential medical services and, and, and that we need. Um, so that's sort of an overview of the capital plan. Um, I, I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the impact that coronavirus has had on the Port Authority and our ability to deliver on that plan, but I'll um, stop there and uh, we'll come back to the, to the COVID stuff in a little bit. Peter, it really is amazing when you think about the breadth of all the projects, the infrastructure, and the impact that the Port Authority has, you know, on this entire region. I don't think people quite realize how uh, extensive it all is. Um, okay. yeah, absolutely. So um, let, let me next turn to Sam Donaldson with, with ACOM. Uh, Sam has worked in the New Jersey transportation market for over 25 years and is currently the Chief Development Officer for New Jersey for, for ACOM, a worldwide architectural engineering and construction firm of approximately 65,000 employees in over 150 countries. As ACOM's Chief Development Officer, he works with all of ACOM's business lines on business development, strategy, client management, and major program management. Prior to joining ACOM, Sam has spent 20 years with the South Jersey uh, Transportation Authority, 10 years as its chief engineer before moving on to deputy executive director and ultimately uh, executive director before he left to join the private sector. Sam is a licensed engineer in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, married with three kids, all living in, in South Jersey. Sam, you know, you and ACOM touch on all different types of infrastructure projects. Uh, what is your take as to where New Jersey is headed and where we need to head? Well, thanks very much, Ray. And uh, first, let me uh, thank the Business Industry Association for being included. Uh, this is a great panel. It's an honor, really, to be on here with uh, the other panelists. And Peter's a very hard act to follow. They got a very uh, progressive and aggressive program. So, um, so uh, kudos to the Port Authority. But um, in in the intro, thank you for that, Ray. Uh, kind of touched on my transportation background. So, and really, I think we've we're we're in a great spot. We've got a good story to tell. Uh, in New Jersey, um, you know, and, and we all know the transportation is, is uh, really the lifeblood to a vibrant and growing economy. And for the first time in a long time, um, you know, thing, things are looking very positive for New Jersey. And, you know, my work with AECOM, I kind of work throughout the East region uh, within the company. And, uh, you know, all eyes are kind of focused on New Jersey right now because of some of the changes that have been uh, made in transportation funding just in the last uh, six to 12 months or so. Um, you know, as we look at what the title of this panel is, is kind of, you know, being set for uh, transportation investment or, or just tr infrastructure investment into the future. And I, I wanted to point to, to three uh, examples very briefly uh, in the past in the north, central and south parts of the state to kind of set the stage for what has been done and I think where we're going. And real quickly, like Hudson Bergen Light Rail up north and um, the investment that was made on the part of New Jersey Transit in this very environmentally friendly mobility option that they have for the folks in and residents of New uh, Jersey City and Bayonne and so forth. In the central part of the state, uh, the interchange six to nine widening on the New Jersey Turnpike. Anybody that traveled the Turnpike before and after that project uh, needs no explanation for uh, how much of a, uh, an improvement that that investment played um, and really gave back and improved the quality of life for those like myself that, that uh, use that road on a daily basis or at least did before uh, I started working out of my house on an almost full-time basis. Um, and then down in the southern part of the state, South Jersey Transportation Authority, my old agency, as you mentioned, Ray, uh, with the Atlantic City Brigantine Connector, which was almost 20 years ago, you know, the also known as the Atlantic City Tunnel. Um, it was that, and I'll focus on that. That was a $330 million investment on the part of public sector. Actually, it was a P3, but it, it laid the, the groundwork for billions of dollars in investment by the Brigada, what's now the Golden Nugget, Harris expansions and so forth. And kind of, you know, Peter touched on this as well. You know, a relatively smaller investment on the part of the public sector can yield significant private sector in investment. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a great return on that money. And I think Port Authority has done it very well. 
I think the, the state of New Jersey and its transportation agencies are about to embark on that also. Um, so, you know, if you, we take a quick look uh, at the transportation agencies, New Jersey Turnpike Authority now has a $24 billion 10-year capital program. SJTA down south has a, a roughly a billion dollar program. New Jersey Transit has announced for the first time ever their uh, first five and 10-year capital programs. Um, around 17 billion, I think 12 of it or so is funded right now. So if you just stop there, before you even get to New Jersey DOT, you're somewhere in the 35, 37, approaching $40 billion of funded capital programs, a far cry from where we were in, in years gone by. Um, and then you add in the, the $2.8 billion program that the Department of Transportation has on an annual basis. And you know, if, if you've heard you know, recently, an additional 600 million that's gonna be put to some th additional three dozen or so projects. So, um, it's, it's a very positive outlook uh, in, in New Jersey. The part that I like the best, frankly, personally, as a, as a former uh, you know, tolls guy uh, working in the tolls industry, much more so, is the fact that we, uh, the toll increases going into the future starting in 2022 are going to be tied to the, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which means that we're not going to be in the situation that we found ourselves in this time where we go eight, 10, 12 plus years without a toll increase. And then politically, it's extremely difficult to try and get a toll increase through because now you're looking at a 30, 40, sometimes 50% increase, which is very a, a very steep political mountain to climb. Now, if we're looking at a two or a 3% increase, this is something um, that's easier to digest, something that people understand more as opposed to a 40 or 50%. So uh, again, kudos to, uh, to the state agencies. Um, and I, I think we really, you got, we have to give credit to Governor Murphy, the DOT commissioner, Diane Scicchetti, John Keller at the Turnpike, Kevin Corbett at Transit, Steve Doherty down at SJTA. And particularly to push through these toll increases, even during the pandemic that we found ourselves in. I mean, that, that takes, a tremendous amount of courage. Uh, at, on this side of it, we see that actual the virtual aspect of the public engagement, public hearings allow for significant more public uh, participation that we would have seen in traditional times. But as we look towards the future, you know, we've got to look at cutting edge and expanded electrical roadway infrastructure. We've really got to plan for connecting automated vehicles. We've got to look at some other way of funding our transportation trust fund, in my humble opinion, like a vehicle miles traveled, uh, type of a, a situation because the motor fuels tax is going to be a source of revenue with diminishing returns, particularly over the next 10, 20 years. Um, and then make sure you're using all the tools in our toolbox, P3, design build, construction manager at risk and so forth. Uh, and again, not to keep you know, referring to Peter, but he brought up, Peter brought up LaGuardia, uh, JFK, what's going on at Newark now, you know, and they're able to leverage that public sector uh, uh, revenue and then really unlock the potential on the private side as well. So um, I, I, it's a good look. You know, we're very excited in the transportation industry. So thank you, Ray. Uh, thanks, Sam. And, and again, there's so much going on on all different sectors. Uh, I, you know, do we even have the capacity for, from a uh, employer employee perspective to meet, meet all these jobs uh, moving forward? Well, I would say that's why we need good consultants. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but it's a great point. And, and I think, you know, I, you look at the state of our public agencies and because it was such lack of funding so long, in many cases, you know, you're seeing some of the really good employees that have vacated the public agencies. Uh, so I think staff augmentation in the near term is something that public agencies should look at in order to kickstart these capital programs. Thank you. Uh, let me next turn to George Kimmerell. Uh, George is the founder and president of Kimmerell uh, Group of you know, Harding Township. George has uh, more than 40 years of uh, diverse industry experience, a registered architect and professional planner. George is also an adjunct uh, a lecturer at both NYU Sh uh, Shank Institute of Real Estate and Rutgers uh, Edward Blaustein School of Urban Planning and Public Policy. He earned his PhD in 2019 from the Blaustein School Focus his research, focusing his research and dissertation work on urban redevelopment practice and policy, 
with a special concentration on community building and branding, as well as institutional realignment for economic development, which includes the subject of infrastructure funding and investment. Uh, George earned his bachelor's degree from, uh, uh, in architecture from Washington University School of Architecture in St. Louis, and has a master's degree in architecture from the uh, University of Michigan School of Architecture. So George is here not only because he is an expert in his professional capacity, but also as a student, uh, he has learned a lot in doing his dissertation. So George, uh, can you tell us what you have learned? And I'll let you know before you start that you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Good, got it. Okay, so thank you. Uh, glad to join everybody and some new acquaintances here for me. Nice to meet you all. Uh, my background, obviously, is as a licensed planner and architect in the state and over, of over 30 years uh, and deeply embedded in the development and redevelopment world of the state, which is essentially a private effort, as we all know. But nothing happens in this state without public support. So I entered Blaustein about 15 years ago and began a part-time uh, PhD effort, which concluded a year or so back. And that effort was really to look at the redevelopment process and what are the enablers that make things happen, not only in the sort of targeted communities like uh, Hudson County, which we all know is booming or has been booming up to, the, up to the time of the pandemic, but in other areas that are slated for ultimately for redevelopment in the state. So the perspective and why I got drawn into the infrastructure issue is that the issue really was about what kind of interventions publicly happen and can happen that jumpstarts redevelopment in this state, essentially underwrites private money uh, to see things happen. So the dissertation spent a lot of time dealing with issues of parking and other issues of you know, major public investments in zones that enable people to move forward. Uh, the structure of this was, an, and I think an interesting counterpoint to some of these you guys are talking about, the structure of this really was about evidence-based design, which essentially means examine user experience first. So the program that I conducted, and frankly, I'm continuing to conduct postdoc, I'll get into that in a minute, uh, really looked at individual users' experiences from a series of focus group scenarios. So for instance, Port Authority, uh, probably interested to hear along with New Jersey Transit, that the rider experience, at least in the minds of most riders in the system, is paramount. Cancellations, reliability is the issue that they focus on. Not so much fare, not so much uh, the quality of the ride per se, but can I count on that agency to deliver me to the place I need to be approximately in the time I need to be? That was a discussion that related to preferences in commuting, commuting by car, commuting by train. Essentially people were opting back to uh, tra individual transport, private vehicle transport because of just the issue of, can I get there when I expect to get there? Or not? Just some of the things that sort of fall out of these discussions. But as I said, the entire focus is really on user experience. So why is that important in an infrastructure point of view? I'm continuing the research with a series of studies. I'm actually joined with the National Organization of Counties, which is a, a organization that actually represents about 2,500 counties around the country. We're conducting a survey together that looks at the current HR2 bill, the infrastructure bill, and the priorities that have been set simply by pulling from the bill the kind of dollars that are being uh, leveraged into what areas. And the question is, what do local users feel about that? What are their preferences and what are their areas of investment that matter? So I'll just give you some quick statistics. Of the $1.5 trillion that was uh, proposed by the Democratic Party back in July, about 33% of that $490 million is really devoted to bridges, roads, and similar, as we would consider traditional infrastructure investments. A third of the total, another $500 million is going out to hospitals, to education. Actually, the second largest behind roads and bridges is actually education, $140 million going to education. In other words, social services are leaking into the funding formulas. Now, that could be good or bad, depending on your point of view, but it certainly diminishes the sense of what infrastructure investment needs to be about if your point of view is the Port Authority or is... Uh, AECOM, who obviously builds a lot of transit-related structures. 
But the fact that uh, the Postal Department is getting $25 million to create a fleet of electric vehicles somewhat diminishes what I think the public in general feels infrastructure spending might be about or should be about. So we're going to look into this. We're going to present some findings in January, which we think will be relevant. And essentially, we're going to ask county public works uh, chiefs. We're going to ask county administrators where they think the money ought to be going and that report back. I think it will reflect a contrast between what's going on today. All of this, I think, is important because it really points to the fact that the investments that are happening, while they all underscore economic advancement, that's their intention, uh, there's different points of view and there's different set sense of where infrastructure dollars, what, first of all, what they are and where they should be going. So that's the acad academic side of things. On the other end, on the professional side, I spent a whole lot of time with developers and corporate executives, and we're doing master plans all over New Jersey for significant redevelopment projects that hopefully will be occurring post-pandemic. I'm sure they will be. Everyone is in the role of re-examining their holdings and trying to reimagine what this thing looks like post-pandemic. Uh, and uh, I'll have some comments about that later because we have made some conclusions about it. Use the phone, phone ringing in the background. Uh, but that's my point of view, is an academic dive into issues that are professional and economic in nature and trying to find obviously some currents that run through all of them that enlightened us in terms of how dollars are spent and why they're being spent where they are. Okay. George, you mentioned that the uh, commuter experience you know, determines whether or not they're going to use a train versus a car or versus um, you know, other modes of transportation. Are you also finding that you know, developers are concerned about uh, you know, uh, those type of infrastructure um, decisions and uh, transportation decisions as to whether or not they can or, or where they, they will build a development? Well, I think it goes to all settings. Okay, everything's being looked at. Housing is being looked at post, uh, in light of the pandemic. Retail uses, obviously, we're heavily involved in the retail industry, and uh, in terms of corporate uh, brand holdings, uh, everybody is re-examining what it means to provide a good user experience now and then post-pandemic. And I think all of this will be looked at. So commuting is going to be a big issue. Is there in fact going to be a drive back to the suburbs? Are people going to opt out of urban settings? Or is there a reasonable alternative for them from a commutation and a lifestyle point of view living in the urban core? So people in Hoboken and Jersey City, as Peter is, uh, raising a family, what are the uh, benefits of doing that, right, for their kids and what are the hardships? And everybody is going to create a balancing act. But to be effective in Hudson County, you've got to do more than provide a 750 square foot living unit, it's now going to imply more. And uh, I think everybody's going to embrace that as we come out of this. Uh, that, that Again, that lifestyle sort of quality of life issue is very important. It's, and it's a basis upon which people are making evaluations about what they're going to, uh, what, where they're going to spend their time and where they're going to spend their money. Thanks, George. Okay. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have uh, Rick Rick Thickpen from uh, PSCNG. Uh, Rick is the uh, Senior Vice President, Corporate Citizen, uh, Citizenship in, well, he was named Senior Vice President, Corporate Citizenship in July uh, 2018. Uh, Rick is responsible for the areas of the business that drive public policy through advocacy, including federal, state, and local government affairs, sustainability, charitable activities, and corporate social responsibility. Uh, Mr. Thigpen is also a member of PSCNG's Executive Officer Group. Uh, Rick uh, joined PSCNG in March 2007 as Vice President, State Governmental Affairs. Uh, he has been uh, a public affairs consultant since 1999 and was the co-founding partner of 1868 Public Affairs, which uh, provides uh, lobbying, strategic uh, planning, public relations, and government relations services to clients in New, uh, New Jersey, New York, and DC. Uh, Rick holds a Doctor of Law from Columbia University School of Law and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Brown University. Rick, you know, uh, PSE&G is obviously the state's largest utility. You are involved in both, uh, you know, uh, natural gas, uh, uh, the transportation of electricity to all our homes. And I know you're now getting out largely from the, uh, 
generation side, but you still own three nuclear power plants down in South Jersey, and I believe you're getting into the wind business as well. So um, you know, we can't talk energy uh, without talking uh, what PSENG is doing. So how do you see uh, the future? So first off, Ray, thank you for having me today. And thanks to BAA for convening this important discussion and for all their work in advocating for businesses in New Jersey. And there is no doubt in my mind that energy infrastructure is central to our state's future prosperity, as well as to its competitiveness and ultimately to the quality of life for millions of residents and really for the businesses as well. So, so I view this discussion as being very, very central uh, to the future of our state. And, you know, and as we talk about energy infrastructure, uh, Ray, I thank you for the kind remarks. I will always refer to PSENG as public service. It's the same name my grandmother called it. It's in our title, and that's how I refer to it. So I want you to hear that. And the public service does have a long history of working with New Jersey. And today we have a new vision. We call it Powering Progress. And the vision is relatively simple, but it's a very important vision. I wanted to talk about it. Because before I talk about it, I also want to mention, you know, public service now views itself as an energy infrastructure company and is tackling the challenge from that perspective. So energy infrastructure is what we're about. It's an important part of our state's future. And in the world of climate change, it's even more important today than it was yesterday, and it will be even more important tomorrow. But our powering progress vision, it's very straightforward. It, first and foremost is for all of us to use less energy and really to use as little energy as necessary. You know, we Americans are energy hogs. We're 5% of the population, I think it is, and we are about 20% of the world's energy consumption. So using less energy, especially in the world of climate change is wise and necessary. And it also makes the energy you do use more affordable. A number two is to make the energy that we do use cleaner. And we just talked about that a little bit. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And third, but by no means least, is that the energy that we use and generate clean is delivered as reliably, as reliably as possible to our customers out there. Absolutely important. And we believe that this vision of power and progress is aligned with our governor's clean energy agenda and aligned with the energy master plan. And, it, and frankly, I say that because it's one of the keys to, to the long-term success of public service is to have a business vision that's in line with the public policy vision of the leaders of New Jersey. And we feel very proud that that's exactly what we're doing. And then if you add in a couple of considerations that are major called climate change, the challenges increasingly paid attention to of managing human capital, uh, hearing the calls for social justice and equity, and then always community engagement when you do projects are key elements to add to our vision that make it easiest for the partnership with the public sector that we crave to achieve New Jersey's public policy goals to come to life. If we can do our part and we can exercise our vision, we believe that New Jersey will be better off and that we'll be more successful. And then just to talk about that just a little bit, Ray, I think it's important that, you know, just a few weeks ago, the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities approved a landmark energy efficiency program put forward by public service. And it gives us a three year $1 billion investment in energy efficiency. And it's worth noting that this energy efficiency investment that we are doing is, is significant for us and that we are now the partner to our customers and helping them use less energy, make their utility bills more affordable, requiring the state to spend less money on expanding our energy infrastructure and doing it in a way that is going to also be in line with the state's clean energy goals, the Clean Energy Act mandated that we reduce our energy usage and the vision of the Clean Energy Act signed into law in May of 2018 by Governor Murphy is to make New Jersey a leader in our country in energy efficiency. And a state that deals with climate change being downwind from so many fossil generators, as well as having, I think it's about 150 miles of coastline with the Atlantic coast, Climate change is not to be ignored by us, and we take the responsibility quite seriously. And energy efficiency is, I think, without a doubt, the cheapest way to fight climate change by us using less energy. And, and we are very excited about this program because not only does it benefit the environment, you know, benefit our climate, fall in line with our state's energy efficiency goals, it's going to help all of our customers reduce their energy usage, and it's going to make investments 
all across the board with businesses, multifamily apartment buildings, uh, you know, individual residences are all going to be given an opportunity to help achieve the New Jersey Clean Energy Act savings targets of 2% reduction in, elect in electric use and a 0.75 reduction in gas use. And gas use is, is worthy of a little dialogue in the world of climate change. Close to 75 to 80% of our households and businesses are heated by natural gas. As we try to turn the corner and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, and reduce is the right word, we need a balance of clean energy and fossil fuels together to do the best for our customers, that that issue is out there to be talked about. So there is no doubt that energy efficiency, we believe is a big win for our customers. We are excited about the opportunity to do it. And we are even more excited that we are going to do energy efficiency in a way that is going to be used in a post pandemic economy to help create opportunity and create jobs in, in many of our hardest hit areas economically. So energy efficiency is not only important for our customers in terms of their bills, important to our climate, it's also going to be used purposefully as a stimulus tool. And public service has taken an additional step of not only to create over 3,000 jobs from energy efficiency and perhaps another 1,000 indirect jobs, but also increase our, the share of local minority businesses that participate in our business. So that energy efficiency is something that can benefit everybody in New Jersey. Not only would accomplish the things I've pointed to several times, but it's also going to be used to help stimulate the economy. And we think that is a very, very important part of people understanding why we call ourselves public service, quite frankly. So, so using less energy comes first, having us be the partner to our customers and devising new ways to use less energy is something we're going to be proud of. And it's going to be something this business is going to carry into the future. Now, making the energy we use cleaner is very important. You talked about it. Public service has announced that it's going to sell all of its fossil fuel generating units you know so we will no longer be in the fossil fuel generating business but we still have nuclear power and nuclear power is is very important to new jersey particularly to new jersey as it pursues its clean energy agenda in the sense that today nuclear generates about 40 percent of the total electric usage that we have in our state but it's about 90 percent of the clean energy we generate in our state so nuclear power preserving it, you know, against some winds of policy that have been very damaging to nuclear's economic health is part of our mission. We have a filing in front of our Board of Public uh, Utilities right now to qualify for zero emission credits. That's designed to make sure that New Jersey has access to nuclear power into its foreseeable future. And that is important in so many ways. Not only is the economic activity around generating nuclear critical, and that it provides about 1,600 direct jobs and another 3,000 or so indirect jobs. It is a critical economic asset in Salem County, New Jersey, which many of you may know is one of the poorest counties in New Jersey. And if that generation were to leave the state, people's electric prices will rise. And it's a very simple dynamic. It's called supply and demand. If you take away something close to 40% of your supply and keep demand the same, prices rise. So nuclear is cheaper to keep alive in New Jersey than it is to allow it to close. And it also makes the pursuit of our clean energy agenda infinitely more affordable for our customers. And then also we are very, very proud to become a partner to Orsted in New Jersey's offshore wind effort. That is really a very exciting and bright part of our future. And public service is going to be working with Orsted to you know, develop the 7,500 megawatts of offshore wind capacity by 20, you know, uh, uh, 35. Ocean Wind is the specific project and that's a 1,100 megawatt project off the coast of Atlantic County. We are very, very proud to be a partner and to be a part of bringing to New Jersey the promises of carbon-free electricity generated by offshore wind. In addition to that, we're working with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority on their plans to develop the New Jersey Wind Port, a regional marshalling facility for the East Coast offshore wind industry on land adjacent to the Hope Creek nuclear power plant. So we are doing our best to make contributions in a variety of areas. We also, it's worth noting, are solar generators. We continue to generate solar power in New Jersey. And then 
The third leg, I don't want to ignore at all, which is to deliver power more reliably. You know, and I know Choose New Jersey knows, that frequently businesses make location decisions where to have a plant based on power reliability. That's one of the criteria that matters to them. Businesses want reliable power, and increasingly businesses require 24-7 around-the-clock reliability for their business to function and can't tolerate you know, disruptions, which are coming increasingly in the world of climate change through increasingly severe weather. So that is an important part of our job as well. And, and there's just a couple of elements that first off, there's things like our energy strong investments, which also create lots of jobs, and that we're raising stations above the water line. Sometimes frequently stations are electric distribution infrastructure is located along water, along rivers that can flood, and sometimes it's along the coastline that can flood. And raising those above the flood level so we can protect them against storms is something very, very important. And we learned that lesson the hard way from Superstorm Sandy. Uh, and that is a program that's underway. Our gas system modernization program, we in New Jersey are blessed with some of the oldest gas mains in the country underground and we're modernizing those also creating jobs to prevent leaks of methane into the atmosphere and to make that system stronger and more reliable for the challenges of the future is very important and then there is the reliability and our utility of the future is thinking hard and there's no doubt that in the post-pandemic world we're going to have several new things to think about first off i bet there are people who are working right now from home and our electric distribution systems reliability was focused on business. The most reliable systems are in places like downtown North because that was what the past held. That's where commerce was conducted. That's where the businesses were located. But in this new post pandemic world, we're gonna to have to talk about increased reliability in people's homes so that we can afford to conduct business in this kind of decentralized fashion. And that will uh, mandate investments in our distribution system. And certainly as more electrification takes hold, whether it's electric cars or electric, you know, increase of use of, of electric facilities, we are going to be faced with the impacts of outages are going to be more and more severe and the toleration of outages are going to decrease. And so we have to focus on in investing in the system for greater electric system reliability and also to make sure we handle more variable resources, more solar, more wind that comes on and off. So we're gonna to have to invest in the system and that system is going to have to become smarter, a two-way system that can talk to the customers. So the days of you having to call us and tell us about power outages are behind us because we'll know about it quicker and the system will be able to identify where the outages are, we'll be able to fix them quicker. That is what our customers are demanding of us. So we see a bright future for the company in modernizing New Jersey's energy infrastructure. We see a bright future for New Jersey to have one of the most honor, I'm sorry, one of the most modern infrastructures in the country. We want businesses to choose New Jersey because we have a strong electric system and gas system and reliability can become counted upon. And we look forward to working in partnership with the public sector to create jobs, to make sure that the electricity we afford, I'm sorry, we deliver is both reliable and affordable and clean. That is what's demanded of us. And we look forward to having the dialogue about what's the best way to accomplish those goals so that New Jerseyans can all share a brighter and more prosperous future together where the lights are on when you turn the switch. And I will, I could keep going, Ray, but I think I should probably stop there. I'd like to ask you 5,000 different follow-up questions and maybe we need to have a separate panel you know, on energy issues pretty soon. But, but let me ask you just one quick follow-up. Uh, you mentioned uh, the need for you know uh, energy efficiency to, uh, for people to cut back on what they're doing, but the energy master plan calls for the electrification of both the transportation and the building sector, which is going to mean uh, significant more need for uh, uh, electric generation. Um, and from a carbon-free perspective, um, and I'm reading a book or just finished a book right now called Apocalypse Never which makes the case that um, nuclear power is the most efficient and uh, effective way of producing uh, uh, carbon-free power. But yet there's a public sentiment that's been historically anti-nuclear. Um, the same folks who are arguing for carbon-free seem to be anti-nuclear. You have three aging power plants down in, in South Jersey. 
Um, you know, they're under constant, you know, either political or economic attack. Um, so can you talk quickly about uh, what's going on with those three plants? And do you see a next generation of nuclear coming up, um, coming along? So, yes, because necessity is the mother of invention. There are others who know much more about that technology specifically, but the future of nuclear power is really going to be necessary to uh, uh, our country, but that's all open for debate. In the short term, we are working hard to preserve the three plants. They're not that old, Ray, and, and Salem County, to keep them running and keeping them providing, like I said, about 90% of New Jersey's clean energy. They are under economic pressure from a wholesale electric market that has priced fossil fuels as the cheapest option, despite the fact that we have to fight climate change and we're struggling with that. And then as for public opinion, you're exactly right. But you know what, there's another fundamental piece of that public opinion. The more you know about nuclear power, the more likely you are to support it. The public, because it's not familiar with the details of nuclear power, is available to be scared about it and is available to be convinced that it's not what it really is. So our job is to educate the public on nuclear power, educate them on the benefits of it, and educate them on the wisdom of nuclear power is an important part of achieving the clean energy future that we all crave for New Jersey and to do it in an affordable fashion. Some will call nuclear power a bridge to the future and that's entirely fine. A future that doesn't include nuclear, that's all about clean energy. You know, our governors talked about zero emissions from, from, you know, from energy by 2050. We're open to, to talking about that. But today, the best thing for the people of New Jersey, the most affordable thing for the people of New Jersey is to take steps to preserve nuclear power, not allow people who is fondness for fossil fuels you know, will enable them to close the nuclear power plants. That's not the move for New Jersey. And they are a very valuable economic asset, both in terms of job creation and contributed to our state's gross domestic product down in Salem County. Salem County is, is not doing as well as some other counties you may know. And that county would be hard put if nuclear closed down there. So nuclear's got important local considerations. It's got important considerations for the environment. Everybody in New Jersey could care about, should care about nuclear power because it impacts your pocketbook. It makes your electricity cheaper. And then we have the burden of educating the public on nuclear power so they don't fall prey to those who want to spread misinformation and scare them away from supporting it. It's a challenge we're on and we're looking forward to working with our governor and our board of, New of public utilities to find the best solution for the people of New Jersey, which we believe if we focus on facts will include nuclear power. Thank Rick. Um, Thank let you. me uh, ask a few questions of the panel uh, in the time we have remaining. The reason we are all on a Zoom call today and not all meeting you know, in, in person in some uh, uh, nice hotel somewhere and enjoying uh, lunch together is because obviously it's because of the COVID pandemic. COVID is you know, um, determining you know, how we work uh, you know, our, our roads are emptier, our, our trains and our airports, you know, are, are not, you know, at capacity. Our, our downtowns, you know, are significantly different. Um, I'm not sure if anyone knows, you know, what the long-term future is going to be or how work, you know, is going to be afterwards. But, you know, and anyone could jump into, into this question. Um, how do, does this pandemic, and once it ends, and we return to whatever that new normal happens to be, how is that going to imp uh, impact our infrastructure decisions going forward? Anyone can just jump in. Well, I can certainly jump in from the energy point of view. And, and before I saw Peter move it, and I want to re remind everybody, you know, Peter's presence here is also about a very important fact. Our economy is regional. Our success is regional. Our infrastructure needs to think regionally so that we can have a brighter and prosperous future. And, some, and that can be a challenge for us. But COVID has changed everything. COVID requires work safety rules that are different for a company like public service. When we interact with the public, it requires our workers to be properly trained and equipped with PPEs. If we're gonna do the energy efficiency work we need to do, we're gonna come into your homes and businesses. We have to do it in a safe fashion. COVID also offers the threat of disabling our workforce. And, and you know, it, it, and, whether you or I are sick is one thing, but if our loved ones at home are sick or people count on us are sick, it's also very hard to do your job when you have responsibilities at home. And so COVID is changing our future in ways I talked about it also, 
COVID may require us to have residential reliability standards that are you know, equivalent to the Prudential building in downtown North because that is now where commerce is being conducted. That is something we've got to talk about. So COVID is changing our world in ways that we've got to think about. It's certainly requiring us to modernize our infrastructure so more commerce can be done from home. We need to be able to identify problems with your system at home quicker and solve them quicker. And we've got to keep our workers safe and we've got to keep our customers safe when we do all this work. So a big challenge for us and public services like every company can function if everybody is homesick or everybody is not focused on their job, they're focused on their loved ones at home who are homesick and wondering what's happening to them. You know, we are lucky that even in the middle of a pandemic, people are still buying electricity and natural gas. We're very fortunate to have a business like that. Not everybody is that, is that fortunate. But we're also aware that it's impacted people's pocketbooks. And so we've got to be mindful of how to continue to make it affordable. Thanks, Rick. So I'm here. I'm uh, sorry. But Peter, you, you were about to jump in and say how uh, the, the COVID crisis has impacted your plans going forward. Yeah. Or has it? Absolutely. And I, I can, you know, offer a few perspectives and observations. I mean, you know, first, we have some data that reflects what's happened so far. And I think, you know, Rick is right in, in many ways in terms of what we're looking at in the short term. I'm a little more optimistic that long term, I think people, you know, I'm talking a couple of years after the vaccine and everyone feels comfortable and, and the rates of transmission are well under control, that people will return to their old behavior, there will be changes, there's, there's no doubt. But I can you know, tell you from what we've seen so far as, as we've gone through the pandemic, there's a sort of a tale of two stories at the Port Authority. Our aviation and path uh, passengers and commuters um, numbers hit the absolute basement, 96, 98% of 2019 levels. And 2019 was a record year across all of our uh, departments in terms of our volumes. Um, so, and then you have the port, which has been the most resilient uh, piece of our infrastructure. Uh, we, we did see some declines uh, in, the, in the teens, you know, 15, 16% at the peak, but I can tell you that August, September, and they're only preliminary, but October are gonna be the port's busiest August, September, and October on record. And then you come to the bridges and tunnels, which I think is the most illuminating if you're willing to sort of you know project into the future based on some current data which there are many folks more expert at that than i am but what we saw is that at, at its peak the truck traffic and auto traffic combined was down about 67 percent that has recovered much more quickly we're now november was at 14% of 2019 levels. And October was actually a little better than that. I think some of the increases we're seeing uh, in cases and, and transmission rates have, have depressed that traffic a little bit. But what I read into that is a little bit of mode shift. People are more comfortable, as George was alluding to, based on a quality of commute basis. But I think people feel more comfortable in their car rather than on a train, even though you know PATH and NJ Transit and MTA, we're all doing as much as we can to keep people safe in terms of wearing, requiring masks, enhanced cleaning, we're, we're, we're you know, piloting different air filtration and actually you know, more sophisticated um, air, air systems that can attack the virus. But it's, it's, it's all gonna come down to, to competence. And you know, the Port Authority is very much follows, particularly the, the PATH and the autos and trucks, follows New York, you know, are, are New York businesses going to start asking their employees to come back and on, on what, what basis and how frequently? And I, I think in the short term, it's going to continue to be an issue for us. And in the long term, I think New York will come back. It's a resilient city. It's done it before. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's very hard to say what that timing is, which makes it extra important. And uh, I, I can't say this enough for Congress to take some action on stimulus and respond to the fact that state and local governments, um, we, we're technically not neither at the Port Authority, but we are both. Um, and, you know, we need relief. We need to be able to get dollars in to continue these important infrastructure projects, which are going to be so crucial to the recovery of the economy. Um, you know, these projects create hundreds of thousands of, of jobs and, uh, without federal support, what's gonna, what we're gonna see in our capital plan is projects that haven't started yet, they're gonna start to be delayed. We're not gonna be able to move from a design phase into construction and, and people are gonna, you know, the region is gonna feel the effects of that. 
And so I'll take this opportunity in public to call on uh, Congress and, and all of our uh, supporters in New York and New Jersey who have been excellent to continue that, uh, those efforts and, and uh, see what we can do, whether it's lame duck or in the beginning of the year to um, re-engage on the CARES Act and, and get some money for uh, state and local government. Ray, I will, uh, I, I will second uh, that to Peter, and uh, we're, we're behind you 100%. So, uh, and, and we're seeing with uh, New Jersey agencies as, as well as other transportation agencies around the country exactly how Peter laid it out. We're seeing a different in mode, uh, choices in uh, differing modes for those that are still commuting. Um, we're working with New Jersey Transit in particular, looking at data analytics and video analytics and kind of uh, big data developing scenario planning tools. Uh, to, to predict, uh, based on what we know today, uh, what the ridership should, it looks like now, where it's going. This is help, helpful for them in planning where their operational and capital dollars should be spent as well. So, um, but it, it, we, we've seen a lot of the truck traffic increase on the surface roads, uh, which is then offsetting those that are not commuting as well. But surprisingly, the, the, uh, the traffic on the roadways did come back much faster, I think, than many people were uh, estimating at the, at the outset. So. I'm going to just jump back in for a minute. Let me give you an example. We do a lot of work with the hospital systems around the state. Uh, obviously, at the height of the spring surge, uh, the issue of conversion to ICU beds was a major, major focus for most hospitals. They weren't equipped to turn a typical bed floor into the kind of environment actually that could treat COVID, which had to do with air changes and outside air infusion, et cetera. So one of the questions we asked at the time is, Clearly, any new hospital uh, infrastructure, especially at, at, on the uh, main campus, should be built with anticipating of conversion like this out into the future. Uh, and certainly dollars should be invested as well into making sure that, again, a typical ward bed floor uh, area where we've spent you know, millions of dollars converting because of HIPAA to single occupancy rooms should as well be able to be accommodated to a simple you know, flick of a switch conversion to a, to a clean air environment. Will that sustain? I mean, that's the question. How many of these issues that we know are front and center today are going to be sustaining post-vaccine? Are we going to forget about it all? We're going to kind of cross it off the list that none of this was important. Or will we spend the dollars to arm hospital systems for the next pandemic? And that's a big question. And it's a political question as well. So all these things we talk about that we're learning from COVID, are they going to sustain? And it has to, again, as, it, as I said, it's hospital systems, it's obviously transportation systems, it's the retail economy, it's all and everything that's had to react. Will we, in fact, arm ourselves for the future? I have doubts that that will happen, uh, but I, it is a serious discussion that we all have to engage in. Thanks, George. Uh, we, we only have a couple minutes left, but uh, so let me ask maybe a, a simple question. I actually read, you know, in the paper today, it was only a blurb, I haven't really uh, dug much more into it, but apparently uh, a task force put together by Governor Cuomo uh, said that we don't need the Gateway Project, that we could repair the existing tunnels uh, without shutting them down. So uh, obviously I think Governor Murphy objected to that uh, conclusion. Uh, does everyone believe we need the Gateway Project? That sounds like a Peter question to me. <laughs> sounds like the very question I shouldn't answer, but I, I'll take a shot, right? And I, I think, um, you know, the, the media overstated, I think, a little bit of, of, of what the London Bridge Associates report says and is. But I'll start with the, the premise that uh, the Gateway Project is the most important um, infrastructure project in the country right now. It needs to get done. Um, what what the uh, GDC released uh, in terms of this report was some ideas about, you know, the Gateway Project consists of two things. It consists of a new tunnel and it consists of rehabbing the existing tunnels. What LBA put on the table is what order do you do those in? You know, the Gateway Project traditionally was build a new tunnel, uh, switch the service into the new tunnel and do the rehab. What, what, what this report suggests as a possibility is doing some or all of that scope of rehab first before you build a new tunnel. And not surprisingly, the, the, the carriers, the railroads themselves, who would have to operate in a nights and weekends construction environment for some extended period of time, want to ensure that um, they believe from an operational and a service level 
um, analysis that, that that's doable. And I, I think that that's the question that's on the table. And, um, you know, the, the folks that are smarter than me and um, we'll, 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 we'll tackle that and they'll look at it closely. And every, everybody has the same goal, which is to, you know, make a reliable commute for folks from New Jersey heading into New York and vice versa, and to eventually, you know, get the capacity that we think will, will be needed in the future. And um, I don't think, you know, I can't speak for any any governor or anyone else, but, um, you know, I think my, my sense is that the goals of, of those two um, pillars are, are consistent among all of the leaders that you mentioned, and that, you um, the support for Gateway under uh, a President Biden administration is, is going to be um, great, and I think there's a lot uh, there's a lot of bright things to look to when we talk about Gateway as we move forward. Uh, certainly, compared to the last few years. Thanks, Peter. Um, gentlemen, uh, we are now out of time. Uh, this was a very quick hour. I certainly learned a lot. Hopefully, you know, um, the people watching uh, this uh, panel have also uh, learned a lot and. You know, I actually have a lot more questions now than they had before, but we're gonna have to do this again next year. So um, George, uh, Rick, uh, Peter, Sam, I thank you for all participating here today. Uh, everyone, uh, our viewers, uh, thank you for tuning in. And um, we look forward to, um, you know, moving to the future in the 21st century infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Ray. Thanks all.